And I'm fascinated by all the different ways in which we can share our stories. I mean, of course, there's literature, but, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So the saying goes, I truly believe that we can share our stories through art or through dance or through music. There are so many ways to communicate with other people and to to share a bit of yourself with them and, and have them share a bit of themselves with you. Hey everyone, I'm Bianca Schultz from the Children's Book Review, and this is the Growing Readers Podcast. Today's guest is the super talented and ever so friendly picture book creator, Molly Idol. Her last name is spelled I-D-L-E, but every now and again when I'm typing out her name, it manifests itself into I-D-O-L because I truly idolize her picture books so much. And she's here today to talk about her newest, very poignant picture book, Witch Hazel. Molly began her career as an artist working for DreamWorks Animation, and from there she leapt into the world of children's books. She's the award-winning creator of many books, including The Mermaid Tales Pearl and Coral, Molly's work as an author illustrator also includes the T-Rex series and the Caldecott honor book, Flora and the Flamingo. Molly lives in Arizona with her family. Before we begin our magical conversation, here's the synopsis for Witch Hazel. Transform dust into magical memories in this moving intergenerational tale that celebrates stories and the time we have together. Something magical happens when Hazel and Hilda are together. As the seasons pass, Hazel's broom whisks the dust off many years of joyful memories, and young Hilda watches them come to life. But is it magic making memories? Or are memories making magic? This poignant tale and artistic tour de force from Caldecott honoree Molly Idol gently explores the passage of time and the transcendent power of sharing our stories. Oh, Bianca, thank you so much for having me today. Oh my gosh, it's such a pleasure. You know, you have a bunch of books, more than I can count on my, the fingers on my hands. Um, So, you know, I would love to talk about all of them, but since you have written so many, I thought maybe we could just start with a general sense of what led you to creating books for children. Oh, wow. That's an excellent question. Oh, I always, I always loved making art from the time that I was tiny. And my mom was always so encouraging of that. She is very artistic. She is very involved in the performing arts in theater and dance. And so she was always very supportive of of any artistic endeavor that I wanted to get into. So I drew all through my childhood, but it wasn't until I was about 12 or 13, the movie, The Little Mermaid came out. (laughs) And uh, that movie just blew my mind. I thought, I want to be able to make art like that to share stories that make me laugh and make me cry and that I want to like see again and again. And that started my journey to become an animator. And I did. I, I went through college and earned my BFA in drawing and and then was fortunate enough to get hired as an artist for DreamWorks feature animation in the days when things were still hand drawn, you know? Amazing. And I <laughs> it feels like ages ago now and it, it actually was. Like so um, but I I had an amazing time working there. And after three films, I think the studio made the transition into computer generated imagery and they were very nice in saying, you know, if you want to stay on, we'll be happy to train you in using the computer to make art. And I stayed on for about six months and I just really, really missed making art with my hands. And I remember being slightly confused because making movies had always been my end goal. And I thought, well, they're still offering me the chance to make movies. Why aren't I as passionate about it as I was before? And so I I sort of turned inward and asked myself, well, what is it about making movies that I 
loved. And I thought, well, I loved drawing characters and telling their stories, be a, being a part of that, and then sharing those stories with lots of people. And when I asked myself what other art I could make that would allow me to do that, it was so easy. It was, of course, going to be children's books. It sounds like the just the power of story in general moves you and, and sharing stories is important to you. If you could articulate, why do you think that for you particularly, stories feel so powerful? Oh, well, they're just what our entire lives have made of, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, to me, to share your story is to share your life. To hear somebody else's story is to have them share their, theirs with you and to become a part of it at the same time. I think the sharing of story is integral. I mean, to share is to keep part for yourself and to at the same time give part away, to let part of it go. And that seems to me to be the best of both worlds, right? You know, when you share your story, it's still yours. Only somebody else knows it now. Maybe they tell it to somebody else. And and I'm fascinated by all the different ways in which we can share our stories. I mean, of course, there's literature, but, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So the saying goes, I truly believe that we can share our stories through art or through dance or through music. There are so many ways to communicate with other people and to to share a bit of yourself with them and and have them share a bit of themselves with you yeah beautiful so on the note of sharing a piece of your own story we're going to talk about witch hazel today which is your newest picture book and it bought tears to my eyes because it really tugged on my heartstrings in just such a, I guess, poignant way. So since since the characters Hazel and Hilda are based on your grandma and yourself, mm -hmm. would you share a little bit about your bond with your grandma and what led you to create this particular story? Oh, I, I, how long have you got? <laughs> as long as you want, Molly. <laughs> uh, my, my grandma, we, everybody in our family called her Mana, and I gave her that name. I was the first, the first granddaughter of her first daughter. So I got an inordinate amount of attention as a small child. <laughs> um, and, and my grandmother, who was so sweet and complex and the world's best baker, um, you know, everybody, I, I, I think if you're lucky, you have a special relationship with your grandmother, right? That's it's between grandparents and grandchildren, there is there's just something well, magical that happens there. Um, I remember my mom saying to me once, like, your mana is not the person that raised me. She said <laughs> she's an entirely different person now. You know, she said, My mother was all rules and everything. And and my mana once said to my mother of me, there is no reason to tell her no. <laughs> like, <laughs> which is which is so not true, right? You know, I'm sure there were many reasons to tell me no, but you know, in her eyes, you know, just, you were perfect. Right. And and she was perfect to to me. Um and we never got to spend as much time together as I wanted. We lived on opposite ends of the country. And so every visit with her was, it was so special to me. And, and our time was so, like, we just made the most of every single minute that, that we had together. Um, and as she got older and, you know, and her body became more frail, um, I saw there was just a, a growing, uh, like a, a a disparate sense between how people perceived her and how she perceived herself. You know, all people who met her, you know, in, in her dotage saw was this, you know, clever, wizened little 90-year-old woman who was just shy of five feet tall, you know, <laughs> as if as if that was all she ever was and, and ever had been. But in her mind, of course, she was still the strong woman she was in her 40s, the belle of the ball that she was as a teenager, the little girl who loved to climb trees in the forest that 
uh, were all around her house growing up. You know, all of that was still a part of her. And I could see all of that because I knew her, because she had shared those stories with me. And I wished that I could magically make all of those you know, memory manas <laughs> uh, visible to everyone else that they could see not just this final chapter in her life, but all the parts of her story. And and that's when I started to conjure Witch Hazel. Do you, do you want to talk us through the story just to give readers an idea of what they can expect? So much of the story throughout Witch Hazel uh, is told through memories that Hazel conjures from dust with her broom. And so throughout each part of the story, which is told in seasons, there is a memory of part of Hazel's life. The seasons, of course, being tied to like times in our lives. So spring focuses on when Hazel was, you know, a young child herself, and she's sharing that memory with Hilda. And then in summer, the memory that she shares is of a, an older version of herself and in fall older still. And we go throughout the entire year learning more about Hazel, the Hazels that that were and, and still are inside her. And Hilda, her granddaughter, is learning more and more about Hazel and also about memory and how to conjure that magic of memory herself. We can totally cut this part out because I'm going to share a spoiler. And if we don't, okay. cut, if Molly says we don't have to cut it out, listeners, and you don't want a spoiler, <laughs> maybe just skip forward a little bit. But I, I think you <laughs> want to hear this. <laughs> so <laughs> what I love to sort of put the artwork to the words you just shared about the story is that as Hazel shares these stories, with Hilda there's and she sweeps up her stories her memories into dust you see these illustrations throughout and so there's these beautiful almost like they're not sparkly in the book but they feel sparkly <laughs> these sparkly dust memories that are just beautiful and they they float throughout and you really do get to 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 understand who Hazel has been and who she is but then at the end and here's the spoiler part is that Hazel becomes the dust and the sparkle and becomes Hilda's story. And I just like, <laughs> even now thinking about it, like the, the goosebumps come, I like my eyes water. It's just such a beautiful exploration for me of, of grief and loss. But you could read this entire story and also not feel sad at all. I think me as, as an adult who has experienced loss, like I, that's, that's why I felt that way about the story, but I, it was just so delicate and so beautiful and so sparkly. And I, I just loved that. So I'm just curious for you, do you have maybe a page that is the most special to you I think, yes, I'm, like you said, not to give too much away, um, but the piece I I put off making for the longest, and in fact, even as, I'm, even as I'm saying this to you now, I find myself fidgeting with my hands because talking about it is hard. Um, but there, that moment where Hazel transitions from being in the present to being a memory was simultaneously very, very hard to make, but also incredibly healing and and cathartic to make. And and I think that while I'm having trouble putting it into words, I, I hope that's what the picture conveys. I mean, for me, that is where I was with my mana when she was no longer a part of our present but became a memory and while those moments can be so incredibly difficult and painful to experience 
they can also be unspeakably beautiful. And I cannot imagine not being there with her and being able to hold her hand in mine when that happened. And there are so many people throughout the last few years who haven't been able to be with the people that they loved when that happened. And I now view it as even more of a privilege than I did when it happened. Molly, I wish that we were in person because (laughs) that was a very moving, hug-worthy response. And I'm so grateful for you being so open and sharing with us on, on really the I guess, quintessential meaning of this book for you. And I I think, I, I'm not Jewish, but I think there's a Jewish saying that is, that I really love that is, you know, when somebody passes and you say, may her memory be a blessing. And yes. I feel like that, I just love that sentiment because that is almost what your book is. Your book is ultimately may her, her memory be a blessing. And it's a reminder to anybody that picks it up and shares this book, you know, that we will experience loss at some point in our lives. And and the memories of the people that we do lose are a blessing or, you know, for, for most of us. So. Oh, I mean, and if we're lucky, it, I mean, if we're, it, it sounds you know, odd to say, but if we're lucky, that's what happens to us, right? That we love people so much that it is so hard to let them go. My dad is a mathematician and, and I often, you know, think of, you know, like the inverse relations of things or the direct relation thing of things mathematically. And I think, you know, the, our, our sense of loss is directly proportional to the love that we had for that person. So if you're lucky, you get to grieve for somebody in that way. But also what you're really grieving is that all the things you'll miss. And I found that um, as I worked on this book, the times that I would cry the hardest (laughs) were were happy tears. Like I was laughing, you know, there's like that that bittersweet feeling, Um, you know, things I would think of that we said to each other that were like, ridiculous and like we laughed so hard we cried and they wouldn't be that funny to anybody else you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly and and all these millions of moments that we're so lucky to have had and and I feel I feel so f- incredibly fortunate to have um a platform in which to express that in the form of story and and to make this conversation one that is not so scary Years ago, I, I hopped into a cab. I was doing some bookish event, and I and I hopped into a cab coming into New York City. Um, and you know, it must be years ago if it was a cab, right, and not an Uber <laughs> or a Lyft. <laughs> but, um, but I hopped in the cab, and after I, I you know, said where I wanted to go, um, the driver turned around and he said, "Do you know what the problem with people is?" And I said, "No." <laughs> <laughs> but I'm but I'm interested to learn. And he said, we're all so, so afraid of getting older, you know, and and of dying. And, you know, and we do everything we can to push it away from us. And and we shouldn't ought to do that. And I, you know, you've you've got a real point. Um and <laughs> the fact is that, you know, these conversations, you know, can be seen as uncomfortable, but I, I don't feel that they should be. It should be a conversation about sort of the cyclical nature of things. And, and if we don't talk about these things, if we, then they become bigger and scarier than, than we may already feel that they are. And when we talk about them, we make our grief more manageable by sharing our, our grief with others and allowing them to comfort us. Um, and and allowing you know, if others allow us to comfort them, it's like sharing stories. You keep a part of it and you give a part of it away. And and the more that you share and talk through it, you know, you're really not only sharing your grief, but you're sharing the love you had for this person. And in that way, you keep them going. Yes. Yes. And that's exactly what your book like just it, it just shows that so joyfully.
We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Today's supporter is Jennifer Swanson, the award-winning author of over 45 books for children. She is also a teacher, STEM advocate, and creator and co-host of the Solve It For Kids podcast. Her latest nonfiction picture book is Footprints Across the Planet. Every footprint, from the physical to the digital and the permanent to the fleeting, leaves a mark on Earth telling a story of the past, the present, or the future. What type of imprint will you leave? Journey around the world and experience through vivid photographs how every being on the planet leaves an imprint with their feet, their words, their actions. Whether human or animal, voices or activity, each mark has a purpose to remind us of our history, give us a glimpse of our future, and maybe even inspire us to change the world. Footprints Across the Planet is perfect for the aspiring STEM activists in your life, those who want to change the world, and is available wherever good books are sold. You can visit jenniferswansonbooks.com for more information. There's something, this is going to sound really silly, but there's something that I just love about this book is it's the, it's the color, the, the palette that you use. And I just want to make a comment that I find it really on point with everything on Instagram that is all like (laughs) beige right now, beige and caramel and nudes. And I think Kim Kardashian (laughs) has even released uh, like uh, a Beats headphone collaboration in like all of these nude colors. And so it's like, it's like your book is so fashionable. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, for once I'm on point then. All right. On point. (laughs) So let, let's talk about the process a little bit. Like, like how, how did you pick the, the, this color palette? And, and did the words come first for this or the art first? It was actually what came first was um, just a drawing that I had done of Hazel, of this witch. And I had drawn her with a kitten. And then I had drawn her with this lovely long boa constrictor that she wore like a feather boa. And I started putting together pieces of a, of a story, stories that she might share. She was remembering, you know, past times. And I had shared the idea with my editor, Andrea Spooner, and she said, it just needs, it just needs something. I'm not sure what it needs. And I worked on, on the words for quite a while, but it wasn't until after my mana passed away that I knew how the story would end. And you know what? That's not true. I think, I think I always knew how the story needed to end, but I couldn't bear to tell it until until her story had ended. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't really go there. And it was um, immediately following her, her passing that I was in her house and, you know, helping tidy things up. And, and tidying has always been um, such a, like a meditative and calming thing for me ever since I've been a child. Like if things are out of control, I would go and tidy my room, which is <laughs> maybe not natural for a small child to go do. But well, I have like... one of those in my house. I have a cleaner. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A, t- a tidier. <laughs> yes. So, you know, if my surroundings are, you know, are all, all right, then, then I have, you know, some uh, illusion of control, right? And um, so in cleaning her house, I, I was taking comfort in putting things back the way I knew she would like them. And I realized that that needed to be a part of the story. You know, witches have brooms traditionally, and, you know, you sweep with the broom and you clean the dust. And I thought, ah, oh, we will tell the story through the through the cleaning of her house. Um I was thinking of that old Rosemary Clooney standard, this old house. Um, and when she's, you know, she's not going to need the house any longer. And, and I thought, oh, we'll, we'll conjure the magic through dust. That will be, that will be how we tell the story. The memories will be conjured through dust. And I thought, well, dust is predominantly, you know, white-ish, twinkly looking. And I thought if I, if I illustrate this book in full color, it will diminish the power of the white space 
of the dust. So I immediately thought black and white, but that was a bit too cold. And I managed to find this beautiful paper, um, which reminded me very much of the color of like paper grocery bags. And so that made me feel like that made me feel like I could somehow draw on it without it being so precious, you know, and I, I, I loved that. And I loved the warmth of it and the white on this like rich brown of the paper that sort of took me back to my own childhood drawing on like grocery bags and things like that um, with the graphite just felt like home to me. You know, pencil is where I'm the most happy and, and limiting the palette made it more powerful. I also feel like, I mean, you got obviously so many fans of your Flora series and and Flora and the Flamingo was your, you know, your, has been your award-winning book. And I just feel like it's going to feel like home for a lot of your fans too, because <laughs> there it's just got that same kind of Flora feeling, but it's completely different at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very nice thing to say. <laughs> well, once a book is completed, published, and then sent out to the world, like you mentioned before, your story then belongs to the readers too. So what kind of impact do you imagine which Hazel could have on readers? Oh, gosh. Well, I imagine that its impact will be different on every single person um, because every reader brings themselves to the book, which is what is so special. You mentioned earlier, Bianca, it it touched you because you had experienced loss. And so I imagine that others who have experienced loss will feel one way about it. People who maybe have never experienced loss, for them, I would hope that this is sort of a gentle introduction to, to the conversation and that someday inevitably when they do, might sort of light up a bit in their memory remembering oh i remember that book and and this person who's been through that um but i also just hope that they enjoy it because i hope that the stories that are shared in each subsequent season they're not sad like you said you know we could we can we can linger on the fact that we we all become memory but i think it's also really important to remember to enjoy the times that we're spending. I mean, some of some of my favorite memories, ironically, are of my grandmother relating memories to me. So it's like a memory of her memory. <laughs> um, but but also, you know, like then I there are so many other themes in the book that I that I I love equally as much. I love how this story plays with different notions of the passage of time because it takes place over a year and when you're a child a year seems quite long a whole year you know as an adult a year seems to go by in the blink of an eye for a kitten an entire year takes you from being a newborn kitten to a grown-up cat you know so um and of course for the earth that we're all on, we rotate just once, you know, in that year, you know, in the seasons change. And so I think as much as I'm playing with memory, I'm also playing with, with time. And there's so much that can happen in that one year. And if we're lucky, we get lots of those years. Yes. I've also just had this kind of funny little, like, I don't know, it's made me giggle thinking of it a couple times where you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, caregivers love to go and get Halloween themed books for their kids. Right. And so when we think of Halloween, we think of pumpkins and mummies and of course, witches, right. Or, you know, some, for some people it's predominantly just pumpkin spice lattes, but (laughs) I, I imagine that there's going to be some people that just literally pick up your book because it's beautiful and it has a witch on it and it it suits the current season. So I, and I, I just like, I kind of giggle at like how they're going to pick this up and maybe like come to it just thinking that it's going to be just a fun story about a witch, which it is, it completely is. And and then they're just going to be like 
totally blown away by how mesmerizing it is because you know I I don't know I just it's a very random thought I've had but I just imagine there's going to be people that end up with this book purely because it has a witch on it not even knowing how sort of like deep but joyful and and mesmerizing it's going to be for them well oh gosh Uh, yeah I suppose that could be the case where are the bats right (laughs) you know as I flip through this book now there is not a single pumpkin so you know (laughs) it is bereft of pumpkins um but I, I I also like sort of turning that idea of what is is magical on on its head because you know Hazel is is a witch and I thought I'm I made her witch Hazel for a number of reasons. One, witch hazel, the plant, is has healing properties, right? So there is there is an element of of healing just within her name itself, and and of course she does magically conjure these memories. But I mean, when you think about it, memory and creativity and and love, these are all things that are. I mean, if we're going to call it real, they they are really magical, you know, in, yes. in, I don't need a potion or, um, you know, a spell necessarily. And, and I love the idea that this is a magic that everybody can replicate, that young readers and old, you know, well, let me tell you about the time, you know, and, yes. and they are making their own magical memories. I, I love that you just shared the uh, idea of witch hazel, the plant, and its healing properties. And I have a little, in a previous life, some experience working in the skincare industry. And (laughs) it's true that witch hazel is actually recommended for sensitive skin. Mm -hmm. And like, when I think about this, it, which, which hazel, the book, it's the perfect opportunity to talk about grief and loss for sensitive children. Like I, I truly believe that, that witch hazel, your character, witch hazel and the plant, witch hazel are the perfect application for sensitivity. So <laughs> I never <laughs> thought about love- it. Well, well now, so on another botanical note, so there are these, um, there are these vines in the book, if you if you've got it in front of you, that I grow do. up the front of of Hazel's porch, and they are jasmine, at which my grandmother had uh, growing on her back porch, and so I planted them. They're outside my workshop right now. Um, I have I have some jasmine plants, and that's another allusion to time that happens throughout the book is that the plants actually grow and connect, and jasmine symbolizes love. And they just smell amazing, don't they? Um, and, and smell is another um, wonderful way to conjure memory. You know, if you walk in and you smell a dish that was like, oh, my mom used to make that, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> it just transports you back instantly. Well, we've talked a lot about memories today. And so I would love to ask you, what are some of your memories of becoming a reader yourself? Do you, did you? Do you identify with being a reader as a child? Oh, very much so. I wanted to be a reader so badly I would pretend to read. One of my earliest memories is of waiting in some doctor's office with my mom and having a newspaper that I was reading (laughs) and having her then turn it right side up for me so (laughs) that I could actually read or pretend to read the newspaper. (laughs) <laughs> so I was, I, I wanted to be a reader since the time I could, you know, lay my hands on books. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't actually remember my own process in learning to read, but I remember my parents reading to me every night. And I, I remember like an, a, like a reading accomplishment. My mom had read to me uh, the book, Little Women, I think when I was five or six. And, um, I don't know, spoiler alert for our young, you know, readers. <laughs> I remember her getting to a particular chapter in the book and like breaking down sobbing. And and I looked at her like, what is happening? You know, at five or six, I wasn't quite like equipped to take it all in. But I read the book myself and it was like the first great big book that I had read 
on my own. I think it's like 400 pages, which just seemed epic to me as an eight-year-old, but I made my way slowly but surely through the book. And when I got to that chapter and found myself crying, I thought, oh my gosh, like this book, like I understand more of this book now than I, than I did before. And to be fair, it's become one of my all-time favorite books. And, and at each point in my life, or at various points in my life, when I go back and reread it, I connect with different characters, you know, trying to, to become an author and make books, you know, suddenly I connected more with, with Joe um, in the story. And then when I had my children, suddenly I had this whole new respect for Meg and her twins. <laughs> and, and, and now that my, my own children are, you know, growing up and, and I have one who's going to start college next year. Um, I imagine if I reread it today, I would identify most with Marmy, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the best things about about reading is is how books can grow with you and and vice versa. But I also think that there are so many ways for people to to learn to to read not just literature but to appreciate story in other ways. You know, we we all read each other's body language and we can all you know, interpret a picture and a dance. And when they make us feel things, we are, we are reading into those arts as well. And so I have a great appreciation for, for all reading, both literative and non. <laughs> I love that. So do you get time to read many new release kids books? Because I know a lot of authors will sometimes, um, and, and illustrators will sometimes see what else is going on there out in the world, who, who's creating what, and are you somebody who likes to see what else is being published? And, and if you do, which books are inspiring you right now? Oh, I very much like to, to look out and about, but I, I have to admit, I do it in spurts. When I'm making a book, I try not to to read too many other books because I don't want to be unduly influenced. I go, yes. Oh, they did that amazingly. Maybe I'll try that. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in between when I'm working on projects, then I do, I love to go to the bookstore or the library. Um, oh my gosh. There are too many wonderful people to focus on them all. But I will tell you that one of my, my, my very favorites, um, as my my friend Juana Martinez Neal, I think she can she can do no wrong. I'm always endlessly fascinated by her process and and the work that that she makes. And um, I'm lucky enough that we're critique partners, and so we often share works in progress or when we're having difficulty with a piece. You know, we're we're there for one another, and and so that she is one of my very favorites. Well, she's one of my favorites too. And I, I'm so grateful I, I she has been on the Growing Readers podcast. So anyone listening should go back and listen. And um, Luisa Lafleur, who is one of the editors at the Children's Book Review, uh, speaks Spanish. And so she also inter interviewed Juana in Spanish. So we have a Spanish edition episode on the on the podcast, which I was so grateful that Juana did. She like she she double interviewed with us. <laughs> That's so her. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> well, so since we're talking about Juana, we we cannot close out this conversation without discussing a forthcoming book in which you've partnered with two other fantastic kidlit creators. And when I learned about this book, it's pretty likely that I squealed out loud. I'm not sure because <laughs> there was no one else in the room. I'm like, did I just scream out loud? But I want you to talk to us about I Don't Care. <laughs> I know, right? The title alone just grabs you. It's so, it's a brilliant manuscript by Julie Fogliano, uh, whose work I've just admired for ages and ages. And it is about two people who are very different, seemingly, um, in the small things, but are very much the same in the bigger things where it really counts. And when I read an early draft of Julie's manuscript, I was struck by how much it reminded me of of my friendship with Juana. And I thought, oh, oh, I could um I could draw this as as us, you know? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a second, who am I to draw Juana's perspective of of our friendship? And so I, I simultaneously texted Juana, do you do you want to 
make a book together and uh, sent an email to uh, Julie and, and Neil Porter uh, saying, hey, what if Juana uh, co-illustrated this book? I just totally volunteered her. Thank goodness she said yes. Amazing. <laughs> but, um, and, and we had no idea how we were going to go about making the art, but we knew that um, we love the manuscript and we love each other. And we thought we would just, we would figure it out, you know, like, like friends do, we would just make it work. And, uh, and it, it was an incredible and rewarding experience to work together. We, we were both, we were both so, you know, jumping in feet first, just let's do it. And then when it came time, we were both dragging our feet. <laughs> <laughs> so it was time to make the art because we suddenly realized oh, we actually have to do this now. And and we'd never made art together. It's one thing to be critique partners, right? To tell somebody, I, I think, you know, that could be stronger or that looks amazing. And it's another to to be in making a book together. We were like, this will either make us or break us as friends. <laughs> Like we may never speak again, or you know, this will only make us stronger. And thankfully, it, we were just so so much in sync. There were just endless times where you know we would come to a, a point where we needed to make a decision, and apart, we had made the same decision. We come together. Oh well, great, we solved that. Um, other times, you know, she would suggest something or I would suggest something and neither of those ideas seemed very good. But then together we'd come up with a third idea. Oh, that's it. That's what we should do. Um, it was such a wonderful, wonderful way to work through the pandemic <laughs> because we didn't get to actually see each other at all. But we got to spend so much time together with making art together. It was just fantastic. That's so incredible. I honestly, I'm, I'm so excited to get my hands on a copy of I Don't Care because I, there's there hasn't been a Molly Idol book that I have not loved. And oh goodness! <laughs> like, and then when you combine your work with Julie's and Juana's, I mean, it's going to be outstanding. I know it. So I know you. You know when you don't know why you know, but you just know that's exactly <laughs> how I feel about. I don't care. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, do you know what you have just described? The entire process of that book. <laughs> you know, you don't know, you just know. And that was everybody just, we just all trusted each other, like from, you know, editor to art director, working with Neil and Julie, you know, it, it, it was just an amazing, it, it's not that making a book shouldn't be hard work. You know, sometimes you, you're in the middle of a project and, you know, and it is, and it is hard to make and you're, you're pushing and you're pushing yourself and you want to make the best thing possible. Um, and, and you can feel like the project is, is fighting you or you're fighting yourself, you know, and, and there are other times that a project is, is hard work, but everything just seems to like move like you when you push on on that thing that seems immovable suddenly you can move it and it was like there was just so much love and support going into this whole process from the outset that it just felt like every time we interacted with anyone on the team it was just pure joy and that was such such a wonderful experience that's amazing well molly before we go, is there anything else that you think we need to know about Witch Hazel? Or do you feel like we 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 covered everything? Gosh, I feel like, I mean, yeah, we, I don't know what more we could say. I mean, I'm sure we could talk a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think we focused on all the really like, you know, all the, the most important bits. Well, Molly, thank you so much for creating all of your books. Thank you so much for creating Witch Hazel. It's going to be a really amazing book for so many people. It's going to touch so many hearts. And a special thank you for coming on to the show today to talk about it and to celebrate stories and intergenerational stories and the power of sharing our stories. This has been really special for me. So just a, a big, huge thank you. Oh, Bianca, thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure, and I, I can't thank you enough for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. Be sure to check out our show notes. You'll find links to order a copy of Witch Hazel by Molly Idol. 
If you like the show, remember, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Chromecast, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Subscribe to the show to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, tell a friend to come and have a listen. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To discover more fantastic books, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com.